All right, I, I didn't hear a bell, but my watch is saying 701, so we'll go ahead and get started anyway. Um, I think everyone knows this is our campaign class. Uh, the Bible study we use as we go throughout campaign is the safety chain. Uh, and so what we're doing throughout this section, Gene started us off last week, and, and, and we're kind of just working our way through the safety chain. Uh, and it, not necessarily going through it like we would go through in a study. Uh, that would be a lot quicker than my little section would, would take a lot less than 45 minutes if I did that. Uh, but we're, we're going to, to look at each passage, maybe make sure we have, uh, there it is, uh, that, that we have a, a good understanding of it uh, and, and an understanding of, of what we need to pose to them. And at the same time, if, if they have questions or anything that might come up, I try to address those things. Uh, before we get started too much into our class, I'll go ahead and begin by going to God in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we are thankful to you for blessing our lives in so many ways. Father, we're thankful for uh, this congregation and, and the work that it's involved in. Uh, we want to thank you right now for the campaign that, that has been a part of this congregation for so many years. Pray that you've been pleased by it. Uh, our goal ultimately always is to glorify you and to please you and, and pray that this work, along with any work that we involve ourselves in, will do that. That will help people know about you, that bring people to you and Pray that you be with us as we prepare to uh, enter into this year's campaign. Pray that it be something that we do, not just because we want to do it, but it's something we do because we realize that ultimately we're trying to glorify you and bring people to you. Please help us to always be willing to learn more, to grow and, and to better uh, ourselves and improve ourselves as teachers of your word, as evangelists, as people who... Uh, desire to bring others to you. Pray that this time of study this evening will be one that's beneficial for all who are in here and that we'll walk away from our study tonight with a better understanding that we came into it with. Father, we love you and it's through your son that we pray. Amen. Alright, so what we're going to do is, is go through uh, the safety chain uh, and, and talk somewhat about um, we basically I, I've been given five different sections that I'm supposed to cover and I have two weeks to do it. And so uh, I will talk some tonight and, and then I'll teach also next week and we'll get through uh, these five sections. Uh, before we get into our class, I just want to go ahead and, and bring you up to speed where we left off. Uh, there have been five sections covered already or five sections in the safety chain already. Uh, the first one, if you are familiar with it, is on tradition. And Gene talked about this last week, did a fine job of doing that. Um, basically the idea that when you get into study with somebody is that we want to set a ground, a foundation for, for where we're going to be coming from. See, if, 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 if we are trying to meet somewhere on, on equal ground, on, on level playing field, if we want a, a good foundation, we have to be using the same source of information, right? If, if I go into a study thinking that this is the way I've done things, and so because this is the way I've done things, it's right. And he's going into the study thinking, well, this is the way we do things, and the way we do things is right. Then we're just going to butt heads, and we're going to get nowhere. And so what we have to establish from the very get-go is that I'm not going to force upon you my way of doing things. And, and, and you don't force upon me your way of doing things. It's not about my way or your way. Um, those are called traditions, is, is what we, we usually term that as. Uh, that, that I have a way of doing things. And, there, and there, I, I make no mistake, I, I do. I have a certain way that I do things. Um, I, I do things ultimately, hopefully, because God says to, but, but beyond that, there are things I do just because it's the way I do things. And it's the way I've always done things. It's the way I'm comfortable with doing things. Um, but I'm not going to bind that on you. I'm not going to make you do that. And naturally, I understand that whoever I'm studying with is going to have things that are comfortable to him and, and things that are the way he does things and maybe has always done them that way. But he's not going to put those on me because that's not what we're about. We're not about me versus you and you versus me. We're about establishing a solid ground, not of my word, but that brings us into the second part of, of the safety chain, the inspired scriptures of God. Right? I'm not going to put on you my traditions. You're not going to put on me your traditions. But we are going to meet in the ground where we say, you know what? God's word is inspired. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. We talked about this also last week. That's where we're going to have to, to find our study. That's what we're going to have to ultimately come down to is I'm willing to listen to God and you're willing to listen to God. And, and, if, and if he's not willing to say, you know what, my traditions don't matter, I'm going to follow God, then we're not going to get anywhere. If I'm not willing to say the same, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to, to get at the very beginning of our study this understanding that we're both going to listen to God and we understand the Bible is from Him. And that naturally brings us into this, under, this, this idea, and, and again, we talked about it last week. Why is it that we have right, a, a very small Bible, right? I mean, where, where, where is the Old Testament? Where, where, is, where is Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and, and all those other laws that are given? Because there's lots of other laws that are given in the Bible. Those are inspired of God. Why aren't we listening to them? Uh, and, and we talked about that, and, and I don't need to go into it because Gene talked about it last week, basically. The idea that, that though all Scripture is inspired, if we believe all Scripture is from God, we need to listen to God as to why we had them. Right? I don't doubt that, that, that Genesis is inspired of God. As a matter of fact, I believe that very much true. But even in the Old Testament, we are of the understanding that this is all for the idea of bringing about the Christ into the world. Right? And, and so we read through scriptures that talk about that old law had a purpose. Uh, it brought us to Christ. But, but now that we have come to Christ, we listen to him and, 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 and we follow what is in the New Testament. What is in the New Testament is basically this understanding. It's, it's true always, even in the Old Testament. But, but as we start to understand and study the New Testament, what's imperative to realize is that all have sinned. And that's the fourth section. Right? The reason we're having this study is not because I have nothing better to do the first week of June. It's because you've sinned. It's because I've sinned. Uh, we're not going to tippy-toe around it. We're not going to pretend as if it's not real. Sin is a real thing. The violation of God's law. Transgression of God's law. We're not going to tippy-toe around it. We're going to realize the fact that we've all sinned. And as we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we're all in trouble. Uh, Romans 6 and verse 23, though not in our, our safety chain, says that the wages of sin is death. And that's something we need to, to be aware of. If I have sinned and the wages of that is death, it needs to perk up my ears and I need to be willing to pay attention. Which brings us to the next section is that Christ reconciles. All right, that's, that's, that's why we're having this study. That's ultimately what it's about is the fact that you've sinned and I've sinned. I know you've sinned. I don't know what you've done in the past. I don't know the life you've lived, but I know this, you've sinned. Uh, I, I know I have too. So I don't, I don't hide that either. And you and I and all people in this world need Christ to reconcile us or bring us back to God. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about in our study tonight are five sections, or this week and next week. The first one is this, is that we must obey God's will. All right, Christ reconciles, but he doesn't reconcile everybody to God. As a matter of fact, many people will face judgment unreconciled to God. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. All right, it's at this point that, that within the study we break and we ask four questions. They're very important questions, and we'll get to it uh, here in just a moment. After that, we, we start getting into what we often call the plan of salvation. Uh, God wants to save man. Um, and yet... There is a way in which we are saved. Uh, and, and it's not whatever I want. It's not the tradition I have. It's what God has said, and we've already established that. And what he says we must do is believe. right? And, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Uh, next week, we'll get into the fact that not only belief, but repentance is necessary uh, for us to be saved and be reconciled to God. And then uh, I will uh, teach confession and then... Uh, I don't know who comes after me, but, but someone else will, will pick up from there in, in, in the safety chain. Uh, and so these are the five sections that I'm going to cover over this week and next week. So let's go ahead and get into the first one, and that is we must obey God's will. Uh, within this section, there's three passages in our safety chain. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And John 14 and verse 15. I uh, take a, a few moments and discuss each of these in, in a little bit of detail. Matthew chapter 7, 
verse 21 and 23, as we discuss the fact that we must obey God's will, says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Okay, and so along with this section, the, the, these verses, we ask two questions. The first one is who will go to heaven? Right, and the, the, the answer we want is obviously the, that, that which is said right here, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So, who's going to heaven? He that doeth the will of the Father. That's out of the mouth of Jesus. We believe Scripture is inspired by God. He's the one who said it. Those who are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven are those who do the will of the Father. Not those who do their own will. Not those who do the will of, of whatever anybody said. Those who do the will of the Father. Right? The next question we ask is, will everyone who professes to be a Christian be saved? And, and the, the answer is obviously uh, not everyone. Right? Down here in verse 22, it says, Many will say to me in that, Lord, in that day, um, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Right? So, will everyone? No, not everyone. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, I, look, look I, haven't, I, haven't I done good works in your name? Haven't I, 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 I cast out devils in your name? Haven't I prophesied in your name? And he'll say, no, not, not everyone who says those things to me will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, if, if you think about what is being said here, uh, there's a couple of possibilities uh, that, that he could mean with this, and we're not getting into this with our study because uh, we just want those answers. But, but have you ever wondered, well, what, I mean, why, why does a person have ability to, to cast out a, a devil or a demon is, is really what the word is. Um, uh, why does a person have an ability to prophesy, and yet God says, I never knew you? Uh, I've, I've found that interesting before. Uh, there's a couple of possibilities. One is that the person thinks that they've done that. Uh, there are people who think that they work those types of miracles. There are people, and, and, and some of them are liars. We understand that. Some of them are just, just people who are, who are trying to make a profit or whatever, but not everybody who professes to work those miraculous things is, is just a, a greedy liar. Sometimes people really believe they do that, um, and, and yet they don't. Um, many in, in, in the day when Jesus spoke and, and, and the days following what Jesus said would have those abilities. And guys, it's important to realize that there are people who would have prophesied, having been, been given power from God to prophesy, who will not be in heaven. Maybe they fell away after a time of faithfulness. Uh, maybe they, they, they had an ability and, and yet didn't use it to, to, to the glorification of God or whatever. People could have been given these powers from God and, and still not. See, it's not just about doing good things. It's about being good. All right? It's not like I can do a good thing but also work iniquity and then still be in, in that right world. God doesn't want me to be a worker of iniquity but also be somebody who do, doeth good. You know, I, well, I did good yesterday. You know, I'm, 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 I'm do all these other sinful things, but that man was broke down on the side of the road and I stopped and bought him some gas. That's, that's not what we're talking about. What, what God wants is for you to be a person who does good. Not just once, not twice, but that, that is your manner of living. That is the way you live. Are there any questions or comments about that passage? Okay. Uh, next one. Uh, we go to Matthew 7, 13 and 14. This is actually the same. 
Uh, the same sermon that Jesus is giving here as, as the previous verse. It's from Matthew chapter 7. Uh, it is the Sermon on the Mount, well-known sermon. It's getting there towards the end of it. And Jesus says in verse 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Right? The questions that, that we ask here uh, oh, wrong one, sorry. Uh, are three. What is the way to destruction like? And, and we are aware that the answer to that is the way to destruction. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. All right, there it is. Uh, the second question we ask is what is the way to eternal life like? And that is straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And then the final question we ask, is there safety in numbers? And the answer certainly is no, because few there be that find it. Um, and so, pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, we, we get that. I, I do think it's something we need to, to think about uh, and, and meditate on. I don't like that. I'll be honest with you, that's, that's, that's hard for me, uh, especially at a, at a time when, when somebody is willing to sit down and study with me. Um, I, I think I need to understand that not everybody who sits down and studies with me is going to obey the gospel. As a matter of fact, and, and I, I, I spoke this in, in a lesson a couple weeks ago, if everybody who sits down and studies with me obeys, I'm probably not giving them a fair idea of what it means to be a servant of Christ and, and, and a disciple of His. Because some people are going to decide not to. For some people, it's too much. Uh, I was on campaign two years ago in Shawnee, uh, and I sat down with two people. And, and, and as we discussed um, the Bible, it wasn't baptism that hung them up. I think, honestly, I could have, I could have baptized them if, if, if I just forced the issue and wanted to. But both of them were of the idea saying, you know, I, I know that I'm really not going to change. I mean, I, I can say it now, but they said, I, I know myself. Tomorrow I'm going to, to do what I want to I mean, I'm not going to stop living the way I live. I probably could have baptized them, but I didn't because I have no right to. I have no reason to. Uh, most people aren't going to follow Christ. It's hard to. It means I have to deny myself. And we'll talk about this more in just a moment. If, if following Christ was, was just this, this kind of, you know, you live the life you live, and, and you recognize that, that, that there's a God and you recognize Jesus and, and you say nice and kind things about him and you, know, you celebrate him at certain times. I'm telling you, we live in a society, most people would be going to heaven. I, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but I bet I could walk around my little neighborhood, knock on the door, ask most people, do you, do you believe in Jesus? They would say yes. I say, do you like him? They say, I love him. I say, great. If, if it were true that that's all you had to do to go to heaven, most people would go to heaven. Most people would enter that gate. But Jesus said, no, it, it's not so easy. It's not so easy as that. I mean, we're not talking 50-50 here, right? We're not even talking 40-50. He's saying wide, narrow. There's a large difference between the people who are going to heaven and the people who are not. Most of the people who door you knock on aren't going to want to study because they already go somewhere. Because they already have their beliefs. And, and guess what? Most of them believe in God. I understand that the number of those who don't believe in God is growing, but still, by far, most people believe in God. In our society, most people believe in Jesus. But that's not going to, that's not going to get the job done. This is a hard passage. Yes. I have found that people don't really understand what destruction is. And yeah. you have to explain it to them. Yeah. Uh, again, we, we live in a society who, whose idea and concept of God is far different from 
the biblical concept of God. And, and the idea that God would bring upon somebody destruction is, well, it's quite, quite frankly, it's foreign uh, to the way many people think of God. Uh, and so that is something that the barber brings up. It's true. You're, you're going to have to be familiar with that and aware of that, that, that these people you're studying with probably don't get the concept. And what they need to know, and, and, and as I'm, I'm, I'm all about being nice. As a matter of fact, I, I have two fears as a teacher. There are more than that, but two major fears as a teacher. One is that somebody won't accept the gospel because the one who taught it to him was a jerk, right? I, I don't ever want to stand before God on the day of judgment knowing that a person wouldn't accept the gospel because I was rude and unloving and mean. I don't think that would fare too well for me. On the other hand, I don't want to face judgment having been so concerned about not hurting someone's feelings that I never got around to telling the person what they needed to know. Right. You can tell people what they need to know in a very nice way, in a very loving way. As a matter of fact, guys, I'll, I'll be, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty frank, I mean, pretty blunt with people in, in, in Bible studies. Uh, that, that, that couple that I talked about that I studied with a little bit ago, uh, I said, and, and, and no, no way of getting me wrong, you will suffer the consequences of this decision, right? I mean, you, if you don't listen to Jesus, you are going to be punished by God for it. Right? And I, I told him, I, I will tell people, I hope you can't sleep tonight. It's not because I'm mean. I hope this person realized the gravity of the situation. I hope you can't sleep. I've known people who have been baptized at 2 o'clock in the morning because they couldn't sleep. And, and I hope that happens. I'll be honest, I've never had someone yell at me in a Bible study. I mean, I've had some people raise their voice, but, but, but never has anyone just, just, just got into me and mad that you're so... Most people, I, I get along with most people in Bible study. I tell you, there's a way to be frank with people and blunt with people and tell them the truth and still be nice, right? And, and show them you love them. And, and, and I've, I've talked to, to people about some hard things. I, I talked to people last, just last year after our campaign. I, I studied with, with a man and a woman who were living together. And, and, and I talked to them about that. They didn't get baptized either because they weren't willing to give up that situation. But none of them were mad at me. They knew that it was wrong. It's funny, there, there's actually different, different opinions, right? He, he wasn't willing to give up that sin she wasn't willing to give up him, right? And so, I mean, that's, I, I think she would have given up the sin, but, but she wasn't willing to live without the man. He was willing to live without the woman if she wasn't going to give him the sin he wanted, right? And, and so, kind of that idea of idolatry that, that you might talk about, who's most important? To some people, it's the sin. To some people, it's someone else, right? But, but people need to know that the wide gate leads to destruction and uh, that, that doesn't lead to uh, a less good place it leads to destruction and 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 and, and Jesus taught that pretty clearly uh, we move on then uh, to our, our third verse of, of this section uh, Jesus taught if you love me keep my commandments All right um, pretty much self-explanatory for the most part uh, we, we ask, if we really love the Lord, what will we do? And the answer is, obey His commandments, right? Keep my commandments. That's what He says. Uh, so, can't really get around that, right? If you love Jesus, you'll keep His commandments. You've heard me say this before. I, I do think it's important when you talk about love, at least for you to understand, uh, love is... is what you've heard me describe for as a fluid term. Basically, I, I think of it like water. Um, water's water. H2O. All right? No matter how you, you shape it, pour it, whatever, it's water. Now, depending on the pitcher it's in, it looks different. 
All right, you put it in a cup, you put it in a pitcher, you put it in a bathtub, you put it in a lake. Water is water, but it looks different uh, based upon where it is. And, and that's the same that is true with love. Uh, love is love. It's always love. And, and actually, the, the idea of love is benevolence, charity, a goodwill. Uh, it's, it's wanting good for others, but it looks different sometimes. Right? Love in a wife looks different than loving a child, which looks different than loving a friend, which looks different than, than loving your enemies. Right? It, it looks different. Um, but, but the idea is that uh, I want good. And, and what, what it does is it, it's based upon the relationship that you're in. Right? And, and so if I'm in a relationship with my wife, then love is going to look a certain way between us based on that relationship. All right? so, so loving Jesus is about respecting my relationship with Jesus, wanting good for our relationship. Treating Jesus like he's my best friend isn't necessarily what what love looks like with him i mean he could be a friend and as a matter of fact i, I believe he is a friend uh, but it's a different kind of friendship all right i have really good friends but i don't obey their commands all right because that's just that's just not what that relationship entails loving jesus wanting our relationship to be right entails me understanding he's my master and I'm his servant. That's why he says, if you love me, if you want this right relationship with me, you will obey my commandments. Because loving Jesus is about respecting our relationship. He is king. I am a servant. He is master. He is Lord. He is Christ. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm his, right? I, I follow his and, and does do what he tells me to. That's what loving Jesus is about. Uh, and, and so it's important that we know that. We, we move on from this section. and we ask, This is when we ask our four questions. The first one is, have you been saved? Um, uh, and then you let them answer, obviously, and, and, and you know, silent partner writing down the answers. And, and this is a really important part. Um, you, you move on from this to say, could you tell me how it happened? Um, uh, you'll hear lots of different answers. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it, it has something to do with with a confession that is made, a prayer that is prayed, uh, a feeling that is felt, or something along those lines. Uh, but but make sure you take note of it. And actually, your, your silent partner needs to write down word for word. And and that's one of the things that I would recommend. Um, uh, since I've been here, I have not been a silent partner, uh, but I have been a silent partner with people in times past, you know, where, where we've studied with people. Um, I, guys, I try my hardest, and, and I write as little fast as my little hands can, but uh, I'm, you know, be, be aware that if you want this person to write down word for word, you're going to need to give them time to, to write down word for word what they're saying. If I say, have you been saved? Yes. Well, could you tell me when it happened? Okay. Uh, how, how long has it been since that? Hey, they're going to, you know, they're not going to be able to get it down. And so say, ask them, have you been saved? Oh, yeah. oh, uh, uh, how did that happen? Okay, and then kind of, you know, repeat it and say, okay, so, so this is what you do. Okay, I, I think I understand. And, and you know, uh, kill time maybe, you know, do, talk with them a little. So, so they can write it down because this is important. And, and, and I'll talk more about this in a moment. But after you ask, uh, could you tell me how it happened? You ask how long after it. Uh, that you were, you, uh, how, sorry, how, how long after you were saved uh, is it that you were baptized? Uh, baptism is something that, that many people have done. Uh, they have not done it necessarily the, the right way. Uh, they haven't done it the way the Bible says, but baptism is a, a religious practice. People in our society, I think you'll find, are generally somewhat religious. Uh, they're just ignorant about their religion. I don't mean to insult them. Uh, it, it, it is true. People do things religiously, and, and, and we're not trying to catch them here. We're trying to help them, right? Because a, a lot of people do things, and it's not that they're bad people and they're dishonest people. They don't really know why they did it. And, and then after you talk to them about it, they'll say, okay, yeah, that, I remember that. that. That's right. And they really think that that's why they did it then. 
Uh, and so it's not like they're lying to you. Um, you know, I've, we do this in the safety chain. Uh, I have always, I guess, been taught to do this uh, from the time that, that I, first time I ever had a Bible study with somebody I was in, uh, where, where I was studying with somebody, I was in college. And uh, the guy who taught me how to do Bible studies taught me to do this. I don't know. The, I don't think it was four. It was three questions. I don't remember what exactly they were. But but basically, you're asking somebody, and, and, and we generally did at the very beginning of the study. But but that doesn't matter. But but the 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 point is is that this is very important because I have. I'm gonna tell you when when I was in, when I I preached in the congregation in Clovis before I moved here, and and this guy was studying with his neighbor, and he couldn't ever get through to his neighbor. And, and so uh, he brought somebody else in, they studied with him, and eventually he asked me if I would come in. And he says, the guy says he's already been baptized for the remission of his sins. He said, but, but that's not what he was thinking at the beginning or whatever. And, and I went to study with and I never could get through to that guy because he was convinced he was baptized for the remission of his sins. And I, I, I don't remember what it was, but I knew his religion, and they didn't baptize for remission of sins. I mean, I've never met a, a, a minister or a, a person from that religion who, who believed that they baptized for the remission of sins. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure if he went to the guy who baptized him and said, hey, was I baptized for the remission of the sins? He would say, no, you're not baptized for the remission of your sins, and fight against it tooth and nail. But he was convinced in his mind now, because he didn't have to answer the question first. And so make sure they answer the question first. Uh, it, it is beneficial to them. Um, and then uh, after we ask that question, if, if they have answered uh, the question uh, that they were baptized, you would, you would ask them uh, to tell you uh, why they were baptized. And, and it might be some people know why they were baptized uh, and, and other people don't. But, but it has been my experience uh, studying with people that I haven't been baptized for the reason God said to be baptized, right? And, and so uh, this is an important section. We move on from this, and this is the last section we'll cover tonight, is that uh, we have to believe, right? So what we've talked about up to this point is, is basically you know, that, that we've sinned, Christ reconciles, uh, but, but he doesn't reconcile everybody. In order to be reconciled, you have to obey God. All right, then you ask these questions and we say, okay, well, how do we obey God then? Is, is basically what we're getting. What is it God wants us to do? If, if Jesus has said, only those who obey the will of the Father who is in heaven, they're the ones who are going. Well, what is the will of the Father? What is it that God wants? And that's kind of the section that we're moving into now, okay? Uh, and, and what God wants for you, from you and me and all people is belief. You, you guys hear me preach. You, you know uh, what I preach about this. this. This is the most important, in my mind, the most important part of this study. Guys, we act based upon what we believe. You've heard me describe it this way, and actually it's been a long time because Alicia said it's a gruesome illustration, but um, I, I think of it as your finger and your fingernails. All right? They want to be together. You pull my fingernail off, that hurts. I don't like it. In the same way, your belief and your morals want to be together. You separate them and it hurts. If I know something to be right and I don't do it, that hurts my conscience. What generally will happen is we'll make those two meet. All right, there are people who believe this and they start practicing this and wanting to do this. And eventually what will happen is they will either stop doing that practice or they will change their belief. Because we want our beliefs and our, and, our, and our actions, our morals to go together. Okay? And so what we do religiously is based upon what we believe. If I believe Jesus was simply a good man, I can believe that. It doesn't really, it doesn't really mean I have to change anything. There are a lot of people in this world who believe Jesus was a good man, but it doesn't affect the way they live. If I believe Jesus was a worker of miracles, that's wonderful. It doesn't really change the way I live. But if I believe Him to be my Lord, ultimate in authority, 
if I believe him to be Christ, my king, that will change the way you live. That will change whether or not you repent. That will change whether or not you confess him. That will change whether or not you are baptized. What do you believe about Jesus? Most people you study with believe in Jesus, depending on how you use that word. Most people believe that, that he lived. Only the ignorant would, would, would argue that. It's a historical fact. Jesus lived. And while he lived, he acquired quite a following. Uh, he did good things. He healed people. Uh, th these are things that, that even people who never accepted Jesus believe. Most people believe things about Jesus. But it's a matter of what you believe about him that will alter the way you live. Right? So belief is, is, is crucial. And, and he goes in. Uh, that clock's different. Uh, John 3.16, let me, let me run through these real quick. Uh, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the question we ask is, what does this verse say we must do to have eternal life? And the answer is, whosoever believeth in him. All right, you have to believe in him. I was going to tell you what this passage It's really actually pretty neat. If, if, if you look right before, he's been describing this time where Israel had rejected God and, uh, and, and, and were complaining about him, and, and they were bitten by all these serpents and, and poisonous snakes, and, and, and they cried out to Moses and, and asked Moses to, to, to relieve them, and, and Moses asked God, and God had him, him put up this, this bronze serpent in the wilderness, and anyone who would look at that serpent would live. And Jesus says, in that way, so I must be lifted up, crucified, and whoever looks to Jesus will be saved. All right, if someone used to look at that serpent and that saved them, now your direction needs to be on Jesus in order to be saved. All right, it's, it's a really neat passage. I wish we had more time to discuss. But, but it's important to note that what do we need to believe? Jesus. Don't believe me. Don't, don't believe anybody else. Believe Jesus. Look to Him. Follow Him. Let Him guide you. Let Him be your teacher. Let Him be your master. Let Him be the Christ. Let Him be Lord. Believe that. And, and, and that brings about salvation. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to pause right there because I don't want to... Uh, I, I want to spend some time, and I said I've, I've got two weeks, and so uh, I'll alter my study a little bit from next week so I can get these last two verses in. Um, but, but you know, John 8, or 8, 24 and Hebrews 11 and verse 6 are the next two passages uh, that we will pick up with next week. Uh, let's go ahead and close tonight with a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for all you bless us with. Father, we're thankful for this time that, that we've had to be together. I pray that our study tonight was beneficial, that it helped us grow as, as teachers, as people to, to understand your word better and and hopefully better able to, to teach that to others. Father, we're thankful for your Son who reconciles us and, and brings us to you and makes it possible that, that we could be saved from our sin and have a relationship with you. We, we thank you for that and pray that um, we will have the faith in Him uh, that will bring that about. Father, we love you. This is your Son that we pray. Amen.